countries. In much of Southeast Asia and the Pacific, the regulations and laws were not so well enforced, meaning Nestle doubled down on their marketing in many of these underdeveloped countries with less restrictions. And thus, their sales continued to increase. Meanwhile, back in places like the US, where sales had stalled, Nestle tried to change their tarnished image and promote breast milk by using some very bizarre ads featuring something called the Super Babies. The idea was to try and distance themselves from the negative media attention they'd received by making out like they'd totally changed. Despite the fact, they were still using the same exploitative tactics to push their formula in countries where they could still get away with it. Even as recently as 2018, a report by Save the Children found the health of millions of vulnerable children were being put at risk because of the aggressive marketing tactics used by Nestle and several other giant corporations. And yet, despite all of the extremely serious problems their tactics have caused, I'm sorry to say that when it comes to Nestle's dark past, we're only just getting started. In 2005, the Nestle CEO implied that having access to water wasn't a basic human right. Das Wasser zu einem uh, um, öffentlichen Recht erklärt wird. Das heißt, als Mensch sollten Sie einfach Recht haben, um Wasser zu haben. Das ist die eine Extremlösung. Ja? After the media criticized him for this, he later backtracked. But to see how he really feels, we can simply look at Nestle's actions when it comes to water. For example, in Pakistan in 2013, Nestle began diverting clean drinking water away from villages and towns and then began bottling it in their factories and selling it back to the same people they took the water from, but at a much, much higher price. The big issue is that Nestle had taken so much water that thousands were forced to drink dirty sludge water instead because these people couldn't afford to buy the expensive bottled water, which, remember, was theirs to begin with. Nestle's strategy was essentially to deprive people of a necessity like clean water and then supply them an expensive alternative. Since Nestle arrived in the country, there are claims they have sucked the land dry and caused water levels to sink hundreds of feet. And it's not just in developing countries where Nestle does this. For example, in America, when California was suffering from droughts, many companies moved their operations out of the state, but not Nestle. In the midst of this very serious water shortage, Nestle Waters continued to pump 705 million gallons of fresh water from California's national parks, draining some of the state's remaining water resources to sell back to Californians. And when asked about this, the Nestle Waters CEO said that if he could bottle more of California's water for profit during the drought, he would. Likewise in Michigan, it was reported Nestle pumped 747 liters of fresh water every minute out of the state reserves, and that Nestle pays only $200 to take 130 million gallons of Michigan's water. After Nestle caused a drastic reduction in the state's water levels, a judge eventually ordered Nestle to stop its operations due to the ecological harm they were causing. Whilst it's perhaps not widely known, the reality is Nestle has the largest bottled water operation in the world and owns over 50 brands of bottled water. So Nestle are actually incentivized to target places with limited clean water available from their own natural resources because if they buy up lots of the natural water supplies and create a shortage, it creates massive demand. If you've seen Mad Max Fury Road, you may remember the guy who was hoarding all the water. And that's not too dissimilar from Nestle's approach. But perhaps where Nestle got a lot of their inspiration was the classic British show Only Fools and Horses. In one episode, the characters decide to sell bottled water by claiming it came from a natural spring when really it just came straight out of the tap. Now, this show was a comedy, but Nestle decided to basically do that in real life. Nestle has simply bottled up water that comes from the exact same municipal supplies as tap water and advertised it as coming from Clear Mountain Springs, thus allowing them to add a huge markup to the price. When, in fact, they can buy a tank of this water for $10, use it to fill thousands of plastic bottles, and resell this glorified tap water for an estimated $50,000. Before we get to the next chapter, can we all just agree that traditional education is broken? Memorizing a textbook for an exam or listening to someone lecture you for hours is not the most effective way to learn and it's not enjoyable either. Which is why I want to tell you about today's video sponsor, Brilliant. If you want to learn genuinely useful skills like coding or problem solving, then honestly Brilliant is the perfect way to learn. They have thousands of online lessons on specific skills and I love how interactive they are because this kind of hands-on learning is just way better. 
Like, I'm planning on doing a documentary on artificial intelligence soon, and I've been going through their course on neural networks, and even though it's a complex topic, they make it straightforward to understand. Plus, not only are Brilliant giving us 20% off a premium subscription, if you go to brilliant.org slash magnates or click the link in the description, then you can get started completely for free. Honestly, Brilliant is awesome for learning new skills. They add exclusive content every month, and I think you'll love it. So click the link below now to get started. When you pick up a chocolate bar, probably the last thing on your mind is how that chocolate bar was made. But the brutal truth is that Nestle has been found to use forced labor and even child slavery on the farms where the cocoa beans are harvested. And for a while, this cheap exploitative labor went mostly unnoticed, leading to low costs and high profits. But then in the year 2000, a report came out that said Nestle was guilty of buying blood chocolates, and that Nestle was fully aware that enslaved children were working on their plantations. Now, this was also true for many of the big chocolate companies. So in the year 2000, Nestle, Cadbury, and Mars all promised to make their chocolate slave-free by 2005. Except they didn't. The years flew by, and they kept missing all the deadlines they set. In fact, in 2005, the International Labor Rights Fund filed a lawsuit against Nestle and other chocolate manufacturing companies on behalf of three Malian children, alleging the children were trafficked to the Ivory Coast, forced into slavery, and frequently beaten on the chocolate plantation. Nestle's response to incidents like this was always the same. They said it was impossible to keep track of everything going on on these plantations, but they vowed to try and improve their situation. But then a few more years passed, and it seemed like nothing had really changed. In 2010, a documentary called The Dark Side of Chocolate brought attention to the media about how children were being stolen away from their homes and families and being forced to work on plantations for very little or no money at all. Then an investigation in 2020 discovered that children as young as eight were picking coffee on the farms of one of Nestle's suppliers. It was reported children worked seven days a week carrying sacks that weighed twice their weight and got paid around one dollar an hour for their work. However, once again, Nestle denied knowledge of this and said they tried to fix it. And to be fair here, this is a complex issue that's certainly not limited just to Nestle. But what does seem clear is Nestle have known about these labor problems for decades, and with their billions of dollars, they could surely have done a lot more if they really wanted to. The only time they seemed to show signs of action against these brutal working conditions was when they were getting negative press. And there's another example of this with what happened in Ethiopia. In 2002, Nestle was demanding $6 million from the government of Ethiopia, one of the poorest countries on the planet. The conflict dated back to the 1970s, when a military regime in Ethiopia seized all the assets of foreign companies and nationalized them. And then many years after this, one of those companies that had had its assets seized was acquired by Nestle, who were now demanding compensation. Now remember, this was a business that was nationalized under a different government 27 years ago, and a business which Nestle didn't even own at the time. But still, to be fair to Nestle here, technically they were entitled to claim compensation. But here's the issue. At the time they were making this demand for $6 million, Ethiopia was facing an extreme famine that threatened the lives of 15 million people. The country was in extreme poverty, with many citizens making less than $100 a year. That $6 million could help provide clean water to millions of Ethiopians. It could quite literally save lives. But despite being aware of this, and despite the fact Nestle made around $65 billion in sales that same year, Nestle initially refused to let Ethiopia off the hook and persistently demanded the money. Even though $6 million was nothing to Nestle. They said it was the principle of the matter that was important. However, once the media picked the story up and people started threatening to boycott Nestle, they immediately did a U-turn and settled the debt for $1.5 million instead and vowed to reinvest it into the country's economy. But it seems pretty clear if it wasn't for the potential PR nightmare, they had no intention of backing down. And if you thought Nestle's controversies ended there, think again. In 2012, the Competition Bureau raided the offices of Nestle to investigate price fixing, claiming Nestle was making deals with other chocolate companies to ensure they all kept their prices equally high so they didn't undercut each other and give customers a better deal. Nestle denied any collusion, but eventually settled for a $9 million settlement the following year. Ordinarily, this might be quite a big controversy, but in the context of everything else they've been accused of, it doesn't even seem that bad comparatively. And to be honest, we we could go on for a while listing allegations against the company, like the legal dispute that claimed dog food produced by Nestle Purina Pet Care resulted in serious illness and death of thousands of dogs, or we could talk about Nestle's terrible pollution stats. But here's the thing. Because of all these scandals Nestle have been involved in, many people have tried to boycott Nestle products. 
up, the company is so vast that it's incredibly difficult because there's just so many different products they sell. They have reach in almost every country with products in so many different categories. When you buy food, water, or even cosmetics, without realizing it, you may be buying from a Nestle brand. Which is probably why despite all of these controversies, Nestle has continued to grow and make more acquisitions to become even more powerful. And to be fair, I'm sure there are many people working at Nestle who just want to make good products in a perfectly ethical way. The issue is that when Henry Nestle founded the company, he was solving a very genuine problem. But unfortunately, as Nestle grew, their business model later started creating problems instead so they could sell you the solution. Of course, when you've been around for hundreds of years and owned so many brands, I guess some scandals are kind of inevitable. Just ask Coca-Cola. To see the disturbing history of Coke, just click right here. I'll hopefully see you there. Cheers.